Great. Well, I see we have, uh, welcome everybody. I am seeing that we have 13 folks who have joined so far right at 10 o'clock on the dot. I know that a couple of folks will still keep trickling in here as we move along. And uh, I welcome you all to our virtual presentation on, uh, I'm covering the, the um, title of Vicky's presentation there, Keeping Meat Birds Healthy. So thank you for joining us. Vicki, can you please unshare your screen as I do our little introductions and start off here? Fantastic. Um, so welcome. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce Vicki Bowes. Um, she's an avian pathologist. She works with the BC Ministry of Agriculture, but she also is an independent consultant who works with poultry producers across the province and, and probably beyond the province as well. Um, I will have Vicki introduce herself um, also during the start of her presentation. And we are gonna start with a round table, but I'll first quickly introduce myself and um, the Kootenai and Boundary Farm Advisors for those who are unfamiliar with our program. So my name is Rachel. I coordinate the Kootenai and Boundary Farm Advisors. This is an agricultural extension program for the Kootenai and Boundary region. We are a program that's funded by three regional districts, Regional District of Central Kootenai, East Kootenai, um, Kootenai Boundary, and then also Columbia Basin Trust. Um, today, are my colleagues are also joining us, Andrew Bennett and Danny Smart. You can see them in the pictures there. And Danny's new to our team. She's in the East Kootenai and going to be helping us with extension activities in the East and, and elsewhere. And Andrew Bennett, many of you are familiar with him. He's going to be helping us with technology and checking the chat box and such today. This event is being recorded. So if any of your friends and neighbors and colleagues didn't catch the presentation live, then we will be sending this out along with some resources in a couple of days. Um, also joining us today is Curtis Smith. He's the owner of the abattoir, the poultry abattoir in Creston, and we'll be giving the floor to Curtis um, just after we do our roundtable introductions so he can introduce you to his abattoir and just some of the things he's noticing coming through his doors um, in the last little bit. And without further ado, I'm going to start with roundtable introductions just so that Vicki and Curtis have a good idea of who's in the room and who they're presenting to today. Um, I've presented virtually before, and it can be very challenging when you don't actually know who your audience is. And so it's really nice to hear where you're from, if you're producing meat birds, how long you've been producing meat birds for, and if you have any key questions you'd like addressed today. Um, the easiest way for us to do roundtable introductions is for me to call out your name because the the way the screen sharing works, it's, uh, it's hard for people to do it on their own. So if you don't want to turn on your video, no pressure, you don't have to turn on your video. But um, I'm going to start uh, calling folks out. And the first person I see there is Alex, Alex and Sarah. Hey, how's it going? Hi, I live in Grand Forks up on the Brown Creek. And I did uh, 160 birds last year, mostly for friends and for our, our freezers and just want to get more into it. Uh, we did all the processing on site at our farm and yeah, we're looking forward to this summer um, and how it's going to play out. So we're looking to go big as far as that goes. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Alex. And Kelsey Luzinger. Hi, good morning. I'm joined by Danny Lane here. Um, we are animal welfare auditors with the BC Chicken Marketing Board. Um, we actually thought we would just jump on here um, more as a support system um, and as, as well as educational purposes. Um, we have attended Curtis Smith's site, uh, or myself has. Um, and yeah, so good morning. Great, thanks to have you join. I, I didn't even know you existed as auditors. So that's so neat to learn about the, the network of professionals out there working in the industry. So thanks for joining today. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. And how about Jamie and Maureen Haynes? You just have to unmute yourself to, to speak. Okay, hi, it's Maureen Haynes. I'm in Rock Creek. And we've done meat birds on and off for like 40 years and um, haven't done, just did a few for myself last year because of um, lack of processing places that are close enough to me. Great, thank you, Maureen. And yeah, for your reference, uh, Vicki, Maureen and Jamie have been, yeah, 
producing meat birds in the boundary area for well over 40 years one of the biggest producers there and just the lack of abattoir processing capabilities meant that they couldn't do it this year and they tried to move forward with doing their own small abattoir and as you know just it's cost prohibitive to basically open small abattoirs so that's one of the challenges we're facing in our region for sure. Um, Sandra Boer. Hi, this is uh, Sandra. I uh, live in Creston and then we're just exploring getting into growing meat birds. Okay, thank you very much. And Sasha Bentel. Hey everybody, uh, I'm Sasha Bentel. My husband Tyler and I, we have Cutter Ranch up in Fort Steele. And I'm on the Zoom call today. We don't do chickens uh, to any scale, but I'm, as a producer of direct to retail, I'm always curious as to what processors would like to see uh, producers focusing on. So that's uh, why I'm looking forward to hearing what Curtis has to say today. Great, thanks, Sasha. And Celeste Archer. Hi, I'm just on for educational purposes. Fantastic, thank you for joining. Dale Drown. Oh, mute. You gotta hit your mute. Dale, you're muted. Dale, you're muted. Um, well, Dale. There we go. Oh, hey. there we go. Okay. I'm back. Uh, so good morning, everyone. I'm in the Blayberry, just outside of uh, Golden, and uh, pleased to be part of this session. Uh, we actually, I was actually just looking after chickens. So that's why I was a bit late coming on. And uh, I might also add that I'm very interested to hear anything about the regulations in British Columbia pertaining to uh, meat hens and especially farm gate sales, because as I think we all know, uh, the regulations, especially for processing meat hens are fairly, uh, fairly strict in British Columbia. And so I'll be interested to hear that plus all the other information this morning. So thank you, Rachel. Great, thank you, Dale. And Jacqueline Kirby. Hi, <clears throat> sorry, can you hear me? We can. Um, I'm just opening a farm, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Uh, and I'm just looking to try and figure out what, what we're gonna do. And I haven't decided if we're doing meat birds yet or not. Fantastic, where are you joining us from, Jacqueline? Oh, we're the farms in Black Creek on Vancouver Island. Okay, great, thank you. And Tim Measures. I'm just here listening, thanks. Okay, great, thank you. And Christy McAllister. To unmute myself. Um, my girlfriend and I raised chickens in Cranbrook and um, this will be our second year doing this together. We had really good success the first year and then last year we lost 70 birds. So we're kind of curious to see what we can do different and um, pen wise, setup wise, starting them wise, anything like that. So yeah. <sighs> Fantastic. I'm so glad that you could join us today, Christy. You're sort of our, our target audience, one could say, um, for those starting out and encountering, trying to troubleshoot issues. So thanks for joining today. Christy, do you mind hey. if I ask how many how many birds you're, you're planning to put through or that you're putting through each year? Uh, the first year we did 149, or we ordered 150 and we took 149 to the butcher. And then last year we decided that we were going to go big. So we did 300 and yeah, lost about 70 of them. So it was, it was a hard year. So we're hoping to do another hundred or another 300 this year as well. Okay. If, well, would, could I say something there? Yeah. Just for future in, in this conversation, say you lost 70. Uh, what stage was that? Just don't want to elaborate on too much just because we're doing a little round table, but when you lost M70, at what stage were they at? Just so we can touch on that later. Um, so we, we kind of thought we had a good idea of what our setup was going to be. And when it came down to it, um, it was a bit of a mess. 
And so we had, we had a pile of them smother each other within the first, you know, two or three days. And then after that, they just kind of randomly started dropping. And then towards our butcher date, um, we lost a couple to prey. And then um, I think our area maybe was too big and they were just having heart attacks and dropping like flies. We had a lot of rain this year, so or last year. And so it's possible they were maybe getting colds and just getting sick and we're not really sure. So it was kind of all different stages, but we probably lost the majority right off the bat. Okay. So, okay. Thank you, Christy and Barbara Ross. Trying to there. Hi. Hi. Um, we've had uh, meat birds for a number of years, but uh, are just trying to ramp it up a little bit this year. And um, we're doing uh, tractor feed, tractor, um, chick, chicken tractor. And we're going to do two or three batches, probably just small, just probably 30 each batch. Let's see and see how that goes with the tractor because we haven't had the tractor before. Fantastic. Thanks, Barbara. And geographically, Barbara's just south of the cusp, um, quite a rural area called Burton. And Eagle ZB. Okay. Go on. Oh, hi, can you guys hear me? We can. Oh, hi. Good morning. Um, I'm calling from Trout Lake, also um, about 40 minutes from the cusp. And I'm pretty new to the area. I'm originally from the Yukon Territory. And so growing of all things is a little bit different from up north to here. Uh, I've had six laying hens in the past and my partner in the Yukon and my partner and I are hoping to do six to 12 laying hens this summer just for ourselves and kind of some friends. Um, and I know this isn't a, uh, specifically about laying hens. I'm just hoping that a lot of the info and discussions will be transferable from meat birds to laying hens. Fantastic. Well, nice to meet you virtually. Also another rural neck of the Kootenai Woods you're joining from. So it's great to yeah. hear people chime in from all over. And Nairi. Everyone, I used to raise broilers back when Passmore Pluckers was still in operation. And now I work for the Basin Business Advisor Program. I'm the agriculture specialist. So I provide free one, -one uh, business advice for agriculture businesses throughout the Columbia Basin. Fantastic. And yeah, if anybody's looking to do some business planning around their chicken production or future projections of chicken production, Nairi is a great person to connect with. She can also help with some of the technology that a lot of producers are facing with COVID going online and trying to figure out point of sale and, and all those types of marketing things. So thanks for joining today, Nairi. And so we've finished our round table introductions. And so at this point, I'm going to hang in, hand it over to Curtis, who will introduce himself, his abattoir, and I'll let you go from there, Curtis. All right. Yeah, I'm Curtis Smith. Uh, my wife and I, we own and operate Chuck Reed's abattoir in Creston here. And then we also grow broilers as well in the last two years on a larger scale than what we started out at with. But when we started, we started out much like everybody else per se. We had a a uh, just a building that was on site that was eight foot by eleven foot, uh, that, and that's what we used as a broder at the time. Um, and then after that that stage, we moved them outside to pasture. We would. Um, but the whole abattoir, when we got looking into wanting to grow chickens, it was more or less of what are we gonna do on, on the 10 acres? That's what we sit on is 10 acres here in the ALR. Um, and chickens was the one that we come up with. And when we started wanting to grow them, that's when we got more involved with, with um, if you're wanting to sell them, they had to be inspected. And then we got looking into the inspection side of it. And there was, at the time, Randy Meyer was running uh, the mobile abattoir at his place, but it just wasn't wasn't what uh, for what we had planned and what we were thinking about 
wasn't uh, the avenue, I guess you could say we wanted to go down for again, planning for the future. If we were going to do this, we wanted to get set up, set up properly to do it. Um, so then the inspection side of it, we got into, and then we figured out that there is a, a bigger need at that time as well for the pro what, what we're in right now as well. There was a bigger need for processing for everybody else who was wanting to grow. So we sort of started with a small idea of just wanting to, to grow enough birds for what we were on uh, 10 acres. Um, and it, it grew into something a fair bit larger it, in the end. Um, so we ended up with 2000 square foot building where we can prop process our poultry and then other farmers poultry from as far away as as Roslyn we had we had people come coming over the pass and then from go on the other side of Cranbrook go all the way up to Wardner I think was the furthest ones that way that we had people bring chickens to us and then a number of people all over the the Creston Valley here um so when we started, we were growing, like the first year, first year we grew chickens, we grew, we did a hundred chickens and 50 turkeys is what we did the first year. And that first year, sort of joke about it now, that first year we grew chickens, we, uh, we did those hundred and we, we processed them in, in December when we got the building done, this is December of 2016. I think we sat on a lot of those birds till next summer we did. It was it was just the the growing stage, the the first year of doing it all and being new to us and whether you want to say it's new to everybody in the valley as well. And, and then the second year, I think we did 150 birds of our own. And I think we processed right around that 3,000 mark as well. And we also had at that time we had jobs off farm. Like I worked off farm. And Meg and my wife, she works off farm as well. So when we started processing, we might have done, we might have processed, say from May till November, that might have been only half a dozen, 12 days out of the year that we processed that was of, of custom. And it wasn't, it wasn't a, a fast process by any by any means from starting out as to where we are now we're processing this last summer we processed from end of may till just about the end of november this year we processed three days a week we did two custom days a week and then we we're doing our birds one day a week so over what are we now we're into it five years and the the amount that we've grown in the five years um is exponential i guess you could say um so but now we're almost getting to the stage where where what it was like when we started that uh there's getting there's that bigger need for for uh processing capabilities again whether it's chicken or beef pork lambs anything in the area so but uh we do our best to 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 provide that service for other small firm farmers to the best of our ability and it some people we can't do but we again we try our best just like anybody else does and and do what we can manage at the same time so so curtis would you say that your abattoir is at maximum capacity right now? Like, could you increase processing, say 20% next year? Or are you looking at maintaining what you've been doing? I wanna to try to just maintain right now and not, not hit that, uh, that stage of getting too big too soon, you know what I mean? There, it doesn't take, doesn't take much of a change in the system to, 
just uh, to throw everything for a loop. But yeah, I think we're just going to try to try to maintain right now and not. Okay. It, it it's again we we try to accommodate the best we can, but at the same time we gotta be able to manage ourselves and manage what's coming in at the same time. So. Great. And so, yeah, I'm bringing, for those on, some folks have never seen inside an abattoir, let alone a poultry mm -hmm. abattoir. So these are some fun shots from about four or five years ago, showing the inside of Curtis's abattoir chuckeries. So you built quite a great facility. I mean, it, it's nice, it's large, it's sophisticated, it's top of the line. I mean, these photos that I took were not intended for really giving, and here's your old, uh, <laughs> poultry, um, pastured poultry, you know, like you were saying, you've come a long way since these Flat days. And feet, yeah. in the back corner, that's the abattoir, right? The, the red box in the back corner. Do I got to do something on my screen here? I just got little pictures. Or is that what everybody sees too? I'm not sure. Probably just little pictures. Oh, okay. I, I'm not sure. There's there. There's the outside of your abattoir. It's the only photo I could find of the outside. Yeah, of the yeah, no, here. yeah, and the bottom, the bottom right there. That was just one from the other day. That was. Yeah, great. So that just gives folks online just an idea of what your abattoir looks like. Um, and so, Curtis, maybe we can hand it over to Vicky, and she can start us on the presentation. And then, as we go through, you can speak to some of the health issues or relevance as we go back and forth. So. This is very much an open workshop, everybody. If you have questions that arise while Vicky's chatting, you can just fire them in the chat box. Um, there's gonna be natural pauses in Vicky's presentation um, where she's, we're, we're gonna open the floor and you can just unmute and ask questions or we can address questions that come up in the chat box. So um, it's fluid and uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand the reins over to Vicky. So thank you for joining us today, Vicky. Um, she's technically, she's physically in Abbotsford right now, so it, it's great that uh, we can facilitate these online discussions and, and bring her here to the Kootenays virtually. Thank you. Oh, this is a great group of people I can already tell, and, and certainly with uh, not only with a lot of experience in, in raising meat birds, but also with uh, curiosity and, a, and an interest in maybe, um, you know, doing that for the future. I'm a board certified poultry veterinarian. I've been um, board certified for 30 years now with the American College of Poultry Veterinarians, which is the only body that recognizes poultry as a veterinary specialty. So um, I've also my, spent my entire career uh, working as a diagnostic avian pathologist with the provincial vet lab in Abbotsford. So it just, um, as a natural progression of, of being a diagnostic avian pathologist and and the you know the the cases that I've encountered, one of the um, components of that is I, I developed probably about 15 years ago a very strong passion for supporting small flocks, and I've taken that to the point where um, I've been very actively engaged with the American Association of Avian Pathologists, which is again an, an American association, and just from the very beginning, developing um, a committee within them that will address uh, small flock because there's the commercial side of raising meat birds and then there's the small flock side of raising meat birds as well as, as any other poultry. And uh, we fall, as a veterinary community, fall really short in being able to provide diagnostic and, and uh, veterinary support for small flocks. And so uh, a large component of what I do is to train veterinarians, um, non-poultry veterinarians, and so they're feeling very comfortable in, in dealing with uh, small flocks as, as a client base. So I do hold, I, I have always, uh, up until very recently, I've always had birds in my life. I've always had uh, poultry. Um, I have uh, had several attempts of, of raising meat birds and very uh, interesting experiences, um, as well as I've always had poultry. So um, it, it's a true passion of mine. So um, I see if this will advance now. Okay, there we go. So 
you know, I'm trying to structure the the, the talk today around uh, just really promoting uh, the best way to raise meat birds. Um, if we can improve the rearing of meat birds, we certainly address the uh, the welfare of the bird. And I think that's first and foremost, we have to be aware that uh, we're in the care of these animals and, and we have to give them a good life for the time that they're on the planet. Um, but also I wanna address the economic productivity because um, there are ways of managing birds that will lead to uh, economic benefit. So if you can reduce the amount of birds that are lost, if you can maintain flock thriftiness, and avoid these unevenness in the flock as they grow through. Uh, impaired feed efficiency is an economic loss. And certainly as we're finding as uh, the protest, processing downgrades and condoms are, are uh, unfortunately uh, a loss economically. Also, when you improve the rearing of meat birds, this will also lead to reduce food safety risks such as um, salmonella. So I also have some personal objectives and uh, these are them. Everyone here goes home and makes at least one beneficial change to the husbandry of their next flock. That to me is like my fundamental goal. I also going to talk a lot about available resources. And so um, I'm hoping everyone will take that home and be able to uh, um, just kind of go through some of the resources that I believe to be credible and helpful. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with social media, so I would I would say avoid the advice that's offered on social media because uh, I think there's a problem with credibility and there's a problem that sometimes it it actually is, can be quite dangerous some of the information that's being exchanged on social media. So um, the way this these uh, educational uh, talks are our uh, program for today, we're gonna to talk about the general principles of raising healthy meat birds, but there's going to be a follow-up session next Thursday. And so this is where uh, it's really important uh, to think about what, it, what questions are coming up, what issues that we can address in next Thursday's session. And Dale, I think when you talked about the regulatory side of it, I don't really address that in my talk, but that would be an amazing uh, topic for next Thursday where we can actually get some of that information specifically uh, for you. Oh, the one thing I wanted to talk about is, uh, yes, my primary role is a diagnostic avian pathologist at the, the vet lab. And uh, we have also traveled around for about 15 years now um, doing small flock workshops around the province. We've gone... Uh, all over the place, including Haida Gwaii. And so unfortunately, because of COVID, the government is under full travel restrictions. And so we were not able to, uh, through that program, provide, uh, the, provide a seminar for you guys through that. Um, one of the things I've developed because of my passion for small flocks is I actually now have a, a, an accredited veterinary facility, a practice that uh, is an independent contracting practice out of Gabriola where I intend to eventually move. So, um, so I kind of, I'm straddling two, two things. One is I have my, my day job and then I have the job that really um, fulfills my life. And that is helping small flock owners um, just do, do better for their birds. So really important right now is that we have some follow-up suggestions for next Thursday's program. If any questions come up through that can't be answered today, um, or if you want um, me to expand on any of the topics that I'm going to address, then please, um, please provide that information to us. Resources. So super, uh, super important. Um, I don't know if anyone is aware of some of these. Um, the commercial broiler industry, each of the strains of, of the poultry, um, all of the strains have their management manuals that are available online. And so you can see at the bottom right, the Cobb one, um, so the broiler management guide, um, the, that's, they're really good resources. In particular, I really like that blue one, the, the Ross. Now, it obviously addresses commercial production in the way that I'll talk about ventilation systems and they'll talk about some of the, the, the bigger infrastructure that's required for commercial production. But the broiler pocket guide from Ross is really good and, and uh, simple and easy to follow and has some very vital um, components that I, I think everybody could take some benefit from. 
Um, Chicken Farmers of Canada also have uh, an animal care manual for broilers that's available online as well. So Chicken Farmers of Canada. But I do want to very much draw your attention to um, the code of practice for hatching eggs, breeder chickens and turkeys. So at the National Farm Animal Care Committee Council, sorry, uh, on their website, you can download that. That is a really wonderful document that has recently been upgraded. They uh, have truly expanded a, a large component of the, um, the euthanasia. Um, and, and it is a very good practical guide for the raising of broiler chickens. So that's, that's certainly something worth uh, exploring. Um, to the right, you can see some of the products that we generated through our small flock program. Um, Rachel did share the small flock poultry health manual online, that, so that's good. Uh, Raising Amazing Chicks was written recently by a colleague in Ontario, and that is a, is a really good, it's, it's a purchase book, but um, that is really worth uh, taking a look at as well. He, he goes through the process of raising chicks, and it's, it's, a, it's a good resource. Uh, we also developed uh, the Free Range Turkey Health and Welfare, as well as the Handbook of Turkey Diseases. So those are components of uh, BC Ministry of Agriculture. We've, we've generated those documents. So you'll see an X through that. And one thing I, uh, I need to explain is that the late November flooding of the Matsqui Prairie in Abbotsford also took out our lab. Our lab was flooded. Uh, it, it has sustained very significant infrastructural damage. And currently uh, we're not able to enter our workplace. Our lab is not functional. Uh, so unfortunately all of my small flock um, resources, including prints of all of those books under the X, were in the basement that flooded and now have been disposed of. So we can't even send these out to you because uh, we're going to have to go through the process of reordering these. So uh, that's why the X is there is that uh, it, they were all victims of the flood. But um, there's lots of really good online resources uh, for the raising of broiler chickens. And so I encourage everybody to take some time and go through that. Again, I, I think first and foremost, I would go for the code of practice um, as well as the Ross Broiler Pocket Guide. Um, all very good resources. Vicki, mm -hmm. um, the Cobb one, Broiler yeah. Management Cobb, that's actually an app too, that is. You can, it's an app? It's, there's an app for that, yeah. You can download nice. it up onto your phone or tablet, whatever. And there's a few different different um, sections in there, whether it's breeder broilers or broilers and the different breeds of them, but they're just got to go through it and pick which one you're after. And it is, there's lots of information in it. Again, it's just, you have to pick out what, it's again, yeah, I guess it's more directed to the commercial side of it, but there is takeaways in there that you can pick out of it that are, are useful to, to a small grower as well there is. So I, I have that, that call, but like I have that on my phone, I do. And oh. it, it, it's just stuff that if you're wondering something, you can just open it up. And it, again, it might not apply directly to you, but you have to figure that out what works best for you and not the commercial end of it as well so yeah but that Excellent. I just wanted to throw that in there no that's that's great to know that 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 has been helpful and uh mm -hmm. again you know yeah I know I you know I recognize that um um you know, we'll talk, I'll talk about it in a sec about, um, you know, the modern broiler chicken, which is something we're, we're all trying to utilize the commercial operations, uh, maximize, um, maximize their productivity, uh, you know, again, uh, driven by economic considerations, but on the, the whole flock uh, side of it, uh, you're still having to deal with uh, a lot of the same components and just have to adapt the principles, you know, and they're very clear. So that's great. And Vicki and Curtis, I just want to uh, let you know that we'll put like the app that Curtis has mentioned and these resources, I'll compile them on our resources page on our website and send it to all the participants on this call. So no one has to worry about writing this vigorously down because we'll send this out in a compiled sort of package, probably in about four to five days. Oh, excellent. Great. 
So the way I'm going to structure today's talk is I'm going to talk initially about um, the first week of placement. So uh, not only placement, but before placement, where you're going to get chicks from, preparing for the placement, uh, assessing chick comfort, and uh, and I'm sorry, you're not going to get away from the fact that I'm a pathologist by nature, and so what a chick necropsy can tell you. Um, uh, um, the next section is going to be on the grow out period, uh, a little bit about nutrition. Certainly, I have to address coccidiosis when it comes to growing birds, leg problems, um, and ascites. Uh, so those are the three primary important diseases we have to deal with in the grow period for broilers. And you'll see a common theme coming through here, why culling is important. One thing I recognize as a pathologist who's receiving birds to, uh, to assess um, is oftentimes it does distress me to know that I'm seeing things that, uh, seeing things that should have been addressed far earlier than when the bird died. And I think culling is a very important management tool. And um, there's really, it's, it's so important to become familiar and to use culling to your advantage. Um, the next section I'm gonna talk about is a little bit about shipping um, and then again, uh, processing. So my question right now for Curtis is, do you provide feedback on, on uh, your condoms and downgrades? Like, do you give back to the producer why birds were tanked? Yes, we do. Perfect. Yeah. That is really important and you need to look at that data quite closely. So I think it's important uh, for anybody raising birds to be having a good record keeping system. And that, that is the production records. I mean, these are very valuable pieces of information that can dictate what changes can be made and how things can be better the next time around. The flock health record should always include medications and possible treatments, but also record keeping of uh, documentation of farm visitors should you have to um, uh, actually do any form of traceability or understand where a disease came from or where a disease went. Um, and so if, I think record keeping also promotes everybody to be looking at their birds in a, in a different way, much more objective way. It's important for early disease detection because oftentimes uh, preceding a disease outbreak, you're going to see you're going to see things like birds drinking extra water or they're not eating as much, those kind of things as, uh, as keys to early disease detection. Also, it's important when you do record keeping is that you can now evaluate whether you make a management change, whether that there's a beneficial effect to it um, and, or whether a treatment has actually made a difference and also the traceability. So I, I'm not gonna talk too much more about the general principles, but I, I kind of separate them out to the point where we're talking about, uh, uh, this is more along the lines of disease prevention. So by isolation, which is a physical separation, you're going to prevent contact with the disease causing organisms. So they stay over there, you stay over here, and then you, then you basically put a break between them. And boy, we've all become experts on disease transmission in the last couple of years. Disinfection is, uh, and sanitation is really important to actually reduce the level of disease causing organisms. Um, disease causing organisms often, to me, I branch them into two. One is that diseases that you can clean out you know, uh, these are diseases that can be introduced, then they can be cleaned out. But unfortunately, a lot of the diseases that poultry deal with are organisms that are normally in their environment anyways. So reducing the level of disease causing organisms is really important to just, you know, allow the bird the natural um, response to a disease, which is their own immunity. And so, you know, sanitation becomes so, so important. And then in the background, if you have the best healthiest birds that's their own and they utilize their own natural disease resistant um, and also combine that with early detection and management of disease so general principles along the disease side of things um, isolation sanitation and health management so that's a, just a synopsis here so in the work that i do with the ministry um, I can tell you, uh, these are the things we've seen. And, and like I said, I've been doing this for over 30 years. So I have definitely seen uh, some trends and, and some disease profiles for small flock that, that feeds into this. We see an awful lot of 
early chick mortality. And so that really is the first week. So both infectious and non-infectious causes of, of mortality of wide chicks die in the first week. We do see quite a bit of blackhead in uh, turkeys. Coccidiosis is always um, a disease threat for any growing bird. So turkeys as well as, as broilers. We see bacterial septicemias and oftentimes uh, it's usually E. coli, which is again an environmental, I mean, fecal material is E. coli, but also we've had a new emergent uh, in the last seven or eight years with this uh, bacteria that's normally in the intestinal tract called Enterococcus. And it's caused quite a bit of problems in broilers because it gets to places it doesn't belong, which are joints in the valves of the heart, uh, in the spinal cord, those places. So um, enterococcus has become a fairly significant disease challenge for small flock um, meat birds. We see ascites and round heart, which is a congestive heart failure um, syndrome. We've seen nutritional rickets. Um, and a, a big one is, and I'll, I'll address this later in the talk, uh, is a foot pad erosions. Foot pad erosion is directly re related to poor litter management or poor range management. So foot pad erosions are, um, uh, you know, to me, they're um, an important welfare consideration because it's preventable. And foreign body impactions, we've seen um, um, ingested foreign bodies, including sharp shavings, we've seen um, staples, we've seen screws, nails, those kind of things where birds are picking that up. So this is a, just a, a, an overview of, of what we see most commonly in small flock meat birds uh, coming through the veterinary diagnostic lab in Abbotsford. Um, any questions at this point? Because now we're gonna get into uh, the, the growing period. Any questions? Um, maybe just one, but it might be covered later. I'm just wondering what the best kind of bedding is then. Yeah, we'll talk about that Okay, a little bit. And if I don't address it satisfactorily, just ask again. Okay, <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so- I have a question. Yeah. Sure. What can you tell if your turkey has blackhead? It's dead. <laughs> okay. Um, it is. Yeah. You know what? I love blackhead because it's uh, I have a couple of diseases that I do like uh, the most rapid diagnosis that can be done like within like two seconds. And that is because the lesions that those birds have are, are there can be no other disease and then blackheads, one of those. Mm -hmm. So when you see a turkey that has um, if you're aware of the sequel pouches, which are the two kind of blind sacs that come off the intestinal tract, um, they're usually engorged with this caseous uh, exudate. So they're thick. Um, mm -hmm. And then combine that with spots on the liver, that's blackhead. And you can do that. Like it's a slam dunk. You don't have to do anything past that because that's what it is. So Right. Way to tell your your and it and, and it it invariably is fatal. So the birds are not going to survive uh, mm -hmm. for very long, especially if um, because I mean it's, it's an interesting pathology because this organism, which is a single celled organism, is ingested, finds its way all the way down to the bottom of the intestinal tract, and and then infiltrates the lining of the cecal pouches. Well, it's really interesting how the, the circulatory system takes all of the things that are being um, absorbed through the intestinal tract. And the first stop is the liver because that's where you want to detoxify things and, you know, all the metabolic uh, uh, things that the liver does. So that's why the combination of thick cecal pouches, spots on the liver equals blackhead. And uh, unfortunately, now the sad part is there is no treatment. There is no real uh, preventative therapy that can be provided. So unfortunately, it's a just it's just a sad situation. Will there be yeah. fluid on the inside of the bird, Vicky? No, 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 no. It's very acute. So there is no time for flu fluid to accumulate. It's just the combination of the thick cecum and liver spots. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So when it comes to sourcing the chicks, and I know there's multiple places to get them from, I strongly, as in strongly recommend that they come from an accredited hatchery. And the reason behind that recommendation is that 
all of the breeder flocks, the breeder hens that are feeding hatching eggs into that hatchery are usually under a health monitoring program that includes routine salmonella testing. So we know that the, the flocks are going to be salmonella free. And as well as these breeder flocks are hyper immunized, they're, they're really strongly vaccinated with the idea that they're going to have lifelong immunity that they can pass on into the yolk so that their progeny, the broiler chicks that you're going to raise, have already uh, start on, starting off with a high level of uh, antibodies against uh, the, the diseases that are vaccinated for. So to me, the health monitoring of the breeder flock is, is, a, is really translates to chick quality. Accredited hatcheries also have, um, can be approached for accountability um, and also traceability. And we saw that with uh, an Alberta, a few years ago in Alberta, mail order hatchery um, ended up uh, dispersing a lot of salmonella and, and we had uh, over a thousand flocks in British Columbia that received birds from that hatchery during that incubation period or during that time where they were they had not quite detected where it was coming from. And because of the traceability component, we were able to, to find those people and um, do some testing on the farm for them. So again, you're not gonna find that with um, home hatch where you're getting it from a breeder that's doing some home hatching or home incubation. Now, the other important thing for uh, accessing it from a, an accredited hatchery is that there's hatchery vaccinations that can be provided. And for me, there's no question, if, you, if you're gonna get any vaccinations done for, for breeder for sort of broiler chicks, it should be for coccidiosis. Absolutely. Um, but uh, we don't really have too much of a problem with Merix at this age of bird. Merix tends to be a, a, a disease of older birds, but you can actually get a Merix vaccine for broilers because uh, there is a syndrome in which there can be a, a form of skin Merix that can do a downgrade at the processing plant. Curtis, have you seen skin merics in broilers? Um, actually, for what, for the inspector to diagnose it, no. Okay. Not, that's not to say that we have, and it's been missed. Yeah. But. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I truly think you can get away with um, merics not vaccinating if you just have broilers. Um, but if you have laying hens, definitely we need a Merix vaccine. But anyways, when it comes down to getting it from an accredited hatchery, please ask for the coccidiosis vaccine. It's, they have come a long way. They're very efficacious um, and very necessary. So the other thing uh, with getting birds from uh, someplace other than an accredited hatchery is that you, you really have an increase in disease risk. Um, with a home hatch. And that can be for the flock that you're getting, but also you can now seed down your premises with, with infectious organisms that may have implications for future flocks. So I would definitely sway you away from getting home hatch uh, to really getting it from an accredited hatchery for broilers. And um, the other component of this, and again, uh, I heard earlier that somebody lost a, a lot of birds in the, in, uh, very early on. So the hatchery has a responsibility to ensure that the chicks are health, healthy and fit for transport. And I think it, you can make the presumption that when they were put into those boxes at the hatchery, they were healthy. And because they they already go through a primary culling process at the pull, when they actually go and process the chicks, they're pulling out the ones that are visibly injured or malformed or, or not doing very well. So the truth is, I think it's, you can make the presumption that they were healthy in the box. Now, what happens to that box of chicks from that point when it gets into the transport vehicle and gets to your farm, all of those, then things start to get a little more um, um, uneven, you know? So, so the, the question about pre uh, preparing for placement. So again, ahead of time of receiving the chicks, it's important, um, always use fresh litter. We're not America, we don't, we don't use our litter. And uh, I can always take a look at a picture of a broiler flock uh, and tell you whether it's an American or Canadian flock just based on the quality of the litter underneath the bird. Um, so for chicks, for sure, you need fresh litter and it has to be an appropriate substrate. So when I talk about that as litter, the role of litter is to be absorptive. 
uh, there's a dilutional aspect of that so that the fecal material is being distributed through, um, through the substrate. So it has to be absorptive and it has to be insulating. So we really rely on the litter to be holding the temperature for the comfort of the birds. Um, in broilers, I mean, in chicks, you can have, you know, four inch, but usually a six inch depth and a big no to some of these alternatives. People have put carpet down. Newspaper is not good. Even if it's shredded, it's slippery. The inks make it slippery. It's so important for their leg structure to have a solid substrate to stand on. Sand is not litter. Sand is not absorptive. Um, sand is, is, is not good for young chicks and you can lead to some impactions too. So the other thing is uh, some of the dried leaves raked up from underneath a tree. That's not good. Um, again, you don't know what you're putting into that barn. And uh, again, as leaves decompose, then you can get uh, problems with slime and, and, uh, and fungal uh, components. So I'm a, a big fan of shavings or um, sawdust and uh, straw as another alternative, although you have to be careful with straw, uh, but it is, it, com it complies with uh, what's important for uh, litter, which is absorption and insulation. So it's really important that once you get your, uh, get your brooder rings in place and you get everything set up for the birds that you have to heat everything up at least 24 hours before arrival of the birds. So, you know, again, you, I think it's really important to invest in like a max min thermometer. They're cheap and uh, certainly they should be placed in a, a round bird height, not directly under a heat source, uh, but in a way that you can take a look at what the temperatures are out th uh, like throughout the day. So it's important to warm that litter up so that it, the birds are not placed onto a cold because they will just start to, uh, it'll just suck the heat out of them. Um, you can see the range of, of temperatures as the birds grow in the chart below. And that char chart came directly from the code of practice from um, the National Farm Animal Care Council. So that's a part of the resources that you can look at. So you can see has, um, I mean, these birds are hatching out at, you know, they're 40 degrees Celsius, that's their body temperature. And so, um, you know, one to seven days, you want to have it uh, fairly warm and then drop it down. The other thing too, is if you, if you actually um, brood hot, then the birds tend not to feather out so well. So uh, during the grow period, anyways, um, so that resource is available to you. So the, the whole component of this is to have good, fresh, clean litter that uh, will, will allow the birds to be comfortable. And it smells good too. So preparing for placement, um, I think it's important uh, about putting uh, brooder rings in so you can control the heat better, but the brooder ring has to be large enough that there's a gradation of temperatures that the birds can find their comfort zone. And uh, in the bigger picture, the stocking, stocking density really is uh, based on what your expected final weights are going to be and, and a general uh, sense about a, a one square meter per bird for the full barn or the full um, grow area. Lighting programs are important um, because uh, it certainly promotes leg health, but it actually um, does encourage birds to get up and walk around when it's light. And it does recognize that there are rest, rest times and then there's activity periods. So initially in the first uh, 24 hours, you really want to have the, the lights on so the birds can find the feed, but then you wanna drop it down. So you're giving them a solid four to six hours of dark. And that these are in barns that are fully light tight so that you have to control the light that way. But it is important to have these lighting programs um, to allow the birds to have these, these uh, diurnal um, patterns. Water, I mean, it's pretty simple. If you're not, if you're going, not gonna drink it, why would you expect the birds to? So the water quality is important. It has to be potable and it should be tested if you're on a well, it should be tested uh, at least annually. Always consider nipple drinkers. And at the bottom right, you can see a very innovative way of uh, delivering nipples uh, in an outside run 
um, the, along the PVC pipe that's got the nipples attached to it. And nipple drinkers can be as simple as the one on the left where you've got a, a hanging bucket and then you've uh, just drilled some holes and attached some nipples. And then, then it's important because, uh, you know, there's a lot less um, water spillage, so it does help reduce wet litter. And it's really important that the water system be sanitized between the flocks. Um, also the use of multivitamins. Now, I do think the use of multivitamins is important in the first few days. Uh, with multivitamin application, the truth is um, it kind of loses its effect after about three days. So if you want to stimulate appetite, if you want to give them a boost, we lose that if, if they're on continual additional multivitamins. So um, I think it's good to put multivitamins in the first, uh, first three days. So, but ensure the appropriate dosage because we've actually seen some um, mortalities related to excessive uh, multivitamin use because the, there's a salt base in there and the birds actually um, can dehydrate because the, the salt multivitamin is actually extracting water. And so it's so important to to pay attention to the uh, the proper dosage. Generally, a, 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 a rule of thumb is about a level teaspoon per gallon of multivitamins is, is really the appropriate dosage. Not electrolytes. So you'll hear a lot of, oh, put them on electrolytes. But um, the truth is electrolytes supplementation really is only important if, you're, if the animal is losing electrolytes. It's important for calves that are scouring to be given electrolytes, but birds are not losing electrolytes. So there's no point in replacing them. So there is, there's no real reason to be giving them electrolytes during the grow period at all. Uh, you'll come across some recommendations for apple cider vinegar. I think that uh, certainly it is not at a pH that is a sanitizer. So it, so, you know, again, I think it smells nice if you apply it, the birds will drink it. But the benefit to me is, is actually unproven. And the one reason I know it's unproven, because I can tell you one thing, if there is something that is effective and does a good job at something, the commercial guys will gobble that up. And so the supplementation of apple cider vinegar, I think does no harm. I think you have to be careful in what your expectations are of what you're expecting it to do. So um, other than that, we would have all of our commercial barns full of apple cider vinegar in the water if it, if it did actually have a significant benefit. Those are my standards I go by. <laughs> um, yeah, so when you're assessing chick comfort, learn how to read the birds. Uh, you can use your temperatures, uh, temperature, your thermometers to gauge the temperature. And again, max mins I think are important because you need to know what's happening in the dead of night. Uh, as far as temperature, but you need to read the birds. And so uh, the way to assess temperature is too high is the birds really are trying to move away from the heat source. And you'll see a lot of flapping of wings. They're trying to dispense their heat. You'll see them panting again, the way the bird gets rid of excessive heat. And also it'll make them very drowsy. So looking at the birds, read the birds. They'll tell you how comfortable they are. They should be evenly dispersed. Um, they shouldn't be, you know, sometimes they will, will sleep flat out, but um, they're looking good as long as they're, they're, you know, some of them are up doing activity, some of them are sleeping. Um, so you get to, to know the natural behavior of comfortable birds. When the temperature is too low, you'll find them crowding around the heat source, you know, ruffling of feathers. Uh, trembling, rigid posture. And of course, they're going to huddle because they're going to try to get heat off of each other. Um, and there's nothing more characteristic than a group of birds that are, are chilled, and especially poults. They have distress vocalization. There's a special, I mean, they're just not comfortable, so they're going to be peeping away. So anyways, know, know your birds, read the birds, and then make adjustments um, from what you're assessing. So in the first 24 hours, once you get uh, the birds down, observe them every couple of hours on the first day. You know, you wanna be assessing their comfort level. Uh, a quick and dirty way to figure out the birds are on feed, which they need to access to have feed immediately. So uh, check the crop fill. So the crop is a, an outpocketing of the esophagus on the right side. And all you need to do is just feel it through, um, through the skin. 
there should be 95% of the birds you check should have feed in their crops within the first 24 hours. So a uh, crop fill is a way to assess that birds are getting onto the feed fairly early. Jump in there. Yeah. Um, just the whole watching, read the birds. Like when I started, I still do it. Um, like I'll go in the brooder and I'll sit there and I'll watch, just watch the just sit there and watch them as a day old, seven days old. And old. Just sit a walk past and look, oh yeah, today. And you learn lots by do, just visually watching them and uh, not just a quick check. So that's it's one thing I started out doing when we started and it's still, I still do it to this day. So every, every batch is different is they're not all, they're not all the same that you get. So that was just one thing. Yeah. No, it's excellent. I think the whole idea of whenever we're dealing with the raising of any kind of animals, I think we have to develop a very strong intuition. And so you're right to spending the time, knowing what normal is, is the only way that's going to trigger uh, a recognition that something is wrong when you know what normal is. And so, yeah, send me a picture of you looking at your birds. I need that for my, my presentation, you know, sitting there with your coffee and with an armchair or at least a, maybe a, a deck chair watching your birds. That's <laughs> a good one. Okay. Um, a little bit about the hatching egg, because I need to talk about yolk sacs. So with this, um, and I'm not sure I can have, I don't know, let's see, I can't really, uh, oh my goodness, I can't really have a pointer. So anyways, I just wanted to show where this yolk, how important this yolk sac is, because we deal with yolk sac infections uh, very significantly with uh, when it comes to, to chicks. So as this embryo is growing, um, it's important to note that the position of, so look at the the, the diet. Oh, I wish I could just, I don't know how I can do this. Oops. Okay. Vicky, try just putting your cursor or you have like a touch one, right? I have a pen. I have a pen. Yeah, because I have a cursor. I don't think people can see my cursor because you're sharing your screen. Oh, can you see the little squiggles? Oh, yeah, today? we can. Oh, I'll just write all over it like a okay, like perfect. <laughs> teacher. <laughs> so yeah, uh, what I wanted to point out is that we have the, the growing chick and um, the yolk sac is, you know, certainly it, like you can see here, the chick is growing over top of the yolk sac. So as it's growing, this yolk sac is external to the body wall. There's a very specific position that the chick has to reach before it can actually pip out. So uh, this is a normal position of a bird that's growing. The yolk sac is external right here. And you can see that the back is against what is going to be the air cell right here. So you have, the like an inner shell membrane that has separated from another membrane to allow this and it's really to do with the moisture loss during incubation so as moisture is lost from the, the egg this air cell starts to form so this yolk sac is again like I said outside the body wall so around like you can again over to this side here over here here um, you can see that same position back is against the yolk sac, yolk, sorry, the air cell, sorry about that. And the, the yolk sac is external. But what starts to happen just before hatch is there is a very specific position that the bird has to move into to be able to pip. So during that process, it's jostling its way and it's, it's feeling the constraints of the shell now because it's big enough that it's pushing up against the shell. So that kind of agitates it and it starts to squirm and, and wiggle and get into this position where it's got its beak under its right wing and it's gonna peck backwards and it's gonna peck into the air cell. And that's the very first opportunity for it to, to start to respire air. So it's gonna start moving air. It also then allows it to vocalize. And in the, in the in a hatch situation, 
um, the vocalization of the first few chicks that get into the air cell to be able to, to generate voice will synchronize the others and will encourage the others to pip as well. So, um, but during this jostling process, what happens is the abdominal wall starts to close in around the yolk sac. So it's brought inside the body wall and the body wall, the muscles around the body wall um, come together and close. So it, it internalizes its yolk sac. So by the time it pips out, um, it should, you should not see a yolk sac. And so I wanted to show you here, this chick here at the bottom left, that's where the, the abdominal wall has come around and met at the navel and now it has internalized its yolk sac. So why this is important is that healing of the abdominal wall around the yolk sac will not occur if there's an infection because infected tissue isn't really gonna heal. So when we have infections in the egg and it can be because the, the eggs were dirty um, and, and at the same time the, the chick is being incubated, the bacteria is being incubated. So it, it hatches out it's, 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 and it's infected. So to me, that becomes, that's a hatchery issue. That is not really related. So when you get a chick that's got, you know, the mortality starts at one or two days of age and you can confirm that there is a yolk sac or a navel infection, then you can, it, you know, that's information that can go back to the hatchery to say, you know what, the, there was a navel infection. And so it's very likely that it occurred in, in the hatchery. Um, so hopefully that physiology helps a little bit to understand when we're gonna talk about yolk sacs. So then, uh, true to my form about talking about, you know, dead things, um, a chick necropsy at this point can tell you an awful lot of things. And so I'm a, I'm a strong uh, proponent of, of doing a necropsy for chicks to determine what the mortality is and uh, what, what has caused the mortality. So uh, to the, the paired picture of the two chicks on the left, what I want to point out is the bird on the far left is actually probably a most normal looking bird other than being dead. But the one on the right is actually incredibly dehydrated. You can see how much smaller it is. Weights are important at this point because this bird being de dehydrated is actually going to be below hatch weight. It's lost enough moisture that it is now below and hatch weight is about 50 to 55 grams. So sometimes these birds are coming in and they're like at 35 grams because they've actually lost moisture. So the, the thing I wanna point out is, is look at how nice the shanks are. They're plump, they're, they're well-fleshed, but in, in a dehydrated bird, you have these shanks that are shrunk, shrunken down. The vein that's on, running on the inside of that leg is very prominent. And, and what, what I'm actually seeing now, those nobles on the joints is actually a form of gout. So again, you know, just looking at the birds without even opening it, you can eyeball it and, and know that there's a dehydration issue. Um, again, the reason why the dehydration can be a multiple factors. Um, and then this is a bird that's just been opened up. This has, uh, um, you can see this is actually the navel on the inside. This yolk sac is nasty. It's uh, dark, it's congested. And I'm also, as a pathologist, I can also see the lungs here. They're very congested. And this is a, a full bacterial infection of this chick. So at this point, because there's an association with the hatchery, it's important to get a lab report because you can take that lab report back. And oftentimes a good hatchery will be accountable to this and possibly issue a credit or, or may just more commonly say, oh, we, you're the only one that ever had a problem with that hatch. But um, again, this is a lab report is evidence. And so I encourage um, the use of the diagnostic lab to provide that, to give you an idea. Now, what's really important during that first week is oftentimes the majority of chick problems are self-eliminating, meaning that they occur, they take out the bird, and then all of the rest of the birds are going to do fine after that. So it's not a matter of really other than things like salmonella that are, that are going to possibly contaminate the whole flock, the truth is the majority of chick diseases um, are, are, are going to self-eliminate. But it does become important to know why the birds um, have died. So I look at that little picture of those chicks. And again, do you see how shriveled up these birds are? They're very tiny. But what the real clue is the fecal pellets attached to the toes. This is, these are two very dehydrated birds. 
So we know that the chicks are very temperature sensitive in the first week and they can be really harmed by chilling or overheating and often this can occur in stress. So that's why preparing the barn for their entry is really important to have all the environmental conditions at their optimum. We get dehydrated birds. Um, sometimes it's a matter of the hatchery setting small eggs because the smaller eggs actually hatch out first. And usually there's a 24 hour period in the hatchery where the birds are hatching out um, and the smaller chicks hatch out first. So they have 24 hours in those hot conditions, the warm conditions. Uh, physical overheating is another form uh, that can dehydrate the birds because they just really can't regulate their moisture. And also just the inability to get to water um, or maybe water, there's not the, um, the right number of waters out there. The water can be too cold. So the birds are not, are not drinking. So dehydration is worth investigating as far as is it conditions in the barn. And again, it comes down to when did the birds die? High DOAs on placement are a clue that something has hatch, happened from the hatchery to the point of delivery. Uh, but then it starts to get obscured as birds start, if your mortality starts to come later in the week. There is a, a syndrome called starve out. Now starve outs will not have any lesions of disease. Um, you will see that they have depleted their yolk sac, which is what they, they're required to live off of for the, uh, and it lasts about three to five days, a little bit longer, five to seven days for poults. So uh, it's really important that birds get onto feed and water immediately. In fact, that yolk sac that's going to be absorbed into the intestinal tract as a form of nutrition, um, it will absorb faster in birds that are on feed and water. So um, this allows, certainly the yolk sac allows birds to be mailed out and to be able to be transported because they have these nutritional reserves to, to draw off of. But it is important that they're onto food and water immediately because they will absorb that yolk sac faster if they get onto feed. So uh, starbouts is an indication that there's probably been some form of stress on the birds prior to them um, getting into placement. But the other sad thing is, is sometimes these birds, even if you figure out maybe they didn't have access to feed and water and you provide it for them, there's, there's a point of no return while the birds will just continue. They'll sit on the feed, they'll sit on the feed, they won't eat it. So uh, starve out is a very specific condition. It is, there will not be any lesions associated with uh, other forms of disease. So we do get these navel infections. Um, when that navel doesn't close over, and heal. And again, we can, it's a stronger association with a hatchery contamination issue. Again, it can be because uh, oftentimes when these birds are pulled from the hatch, that navel will still be a little bit moist and wet. If those navels make contact with like dirty chick papers or they're put onto dirty litter, they can suck in bacteria through that navel. And then you get a direct infection of that yolk sac, which is just behind that healed over navel. So yolk sac infections and navel infections, to me, I make them very distinct because the navel infections to me are hatchery, but you can have a yolk sac infection that has occurred because of this wet navel. Birds are perfectly healthy until they reach the farm and then they're put onto dirty litter and they will, in, they will suck up that bacteria and then it will cause a yolk sac infection. Um, the only other infectious disease we worry about is the brooder pneumonia, which is when you have a contaminated um, hatcher or, uh, or a brooding area and they're, they're inspiring um, fungal spores, usually because there's environmental uh, aspergillus. So those are the kind of infectious things we deal with, with um, yolk sac infections, particularly in, in young chicks. Hey, Vicky. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, on that previous slide, mm -hmm. does that navel infection, can it get, can it or does it get confused with, like you see some of them chicks, they get that pasty butt? Yeah. Do, is, is that, are they both similar or is there, are they separate or do they get confused with one another? 
Yeah, no, they, they can be connected because it can be a, it can be a systemic infection. Certainly the pastiness of the butt can be related to uh, an intestinal infection, but also pasting can occur because the birds are dehydrated. And what you're seeing is the urate is so dry, it's, it's sticking to the feathers around the butt. So mm -hmm. yes, you can have infect, like a full infection where it's not localized to the yolk sac, but it's now in the body, then you get the pasting and the navels at the same time. So, okay. yeah. And uh, this is just to show you um, the yolk sac is connected to the intestinal tract, which is how it's absorbed. But this one is a really nasty looking yolk sac that is uh, full of infection. This bird um, will die only if the, the infection actually goes throughout the rest of the body. Because sometimes even at, I bet, Curtis, that processing, you've seen little, little nubbins of infection in a bird that's been perfectly healthy. And that's from a prior early infection that didn't kill it. So, um, yeah. Yeah, we get on the insides that process and we'll get little, what they call them lesions or little pus pockets that are around the intestines when they get pulled out that yeah. they'll see on, yeah. not on all, all of them, but just the odd one will. Yeah, yeah. All right. so. The grow out period. So we're going to talk about growing, you know, they've survived the first week, like heaven, heaven to Betsy, like they got to the first week. So this is good. So I just want to talk about uh, the type of chicken. And again, maybe I'm presuming the majority of people who are raising chicken are going to be using the modern broiler, which is to me makes completely in perfect sense. So I know that there have been um, some niche markets for people developing breeds of chicken that are intended for meat production um, that are not part of the modern broiler lineage. Uh, but anyways, I'm presuming at this point that, you know, the, the simplest, easiest, and certainly most efficient way to ro raise broiler chickens is to get a modern broiler, which is coming from the commercial hatchery. So we now have to deal with a bird that has actually been genetically selected for rapid and efficient growth and this huge breast meat yield. So that's great because that's what we want. But, and this is what got me into poultry way back in vet school. I can tell you that I became fascinated with the fact that uh, we can generate very specific disease syndromes based entirely on our uh, pushing animals for production. It, it's just like, wow. Because I, because I did my uh, graduate work on sudden death syndrome and broiler chickens. And um, one of the ways of reducing sudden death syndrome is um, I had a flock that I put on a 75% feed restriction and uh, completely eliminated the disease. So I'm like, oh my goodness. So it comes down to uh, because we have the modern broiler chicken, there's going to be some predispositions and predilections for specific disease syndromes because of the way they've been designed. Um, there's a question about caponizing. And again, this is the only thing I'm fairly vocal about some, um, and again, maybe it is just my own, own opinion, but caponizing is no longer necessary. It was a really, and this is uh, castrating a chicken. So this was originally, um, this is a longstanding historic, and I also say archaic, uh, process in which the testes, which are internal and, and sitting up just above the kidneys, is the is um, removed because it was a way of feminizing uh, a male chicken so that the meat was soft and tender. So it's a feminization process through the process of, of castration. So it's no longer necessary because the, the meat that's coming off of a modern broiler chicken is as feminized as it can get. So it's it has all the attributes that were, were promoting caponization in the past. Um, the reason I am a strong advocate against caponizing because it is an intra-abdominal surgery that is done without anesthetic, and it has uh, certainly um, some very nasty side effects if it's not done properly. Usually what happens is an incision, again, um, in, a, in a conscious bird, an incision is made and a loop is inserted and it kind of goes in and it loops around the testis and then it kind of strangles it. And that's how caponizing is done. Again, no anesthetic, no suturing of the, of the uh, incision site. So 
uh, don't talk to me about caponizing because you'll never convince me that it's it's uh, an appropriate procedure. So I know some people feel strongly the other way too. And uh, yes, so don't caponize. Oh, okay, so this is a theme I really wanted to promote because uh, as we go through this growth period, you'll see this word coming up time and again, and that's culling. Um, nothing distresses me more than seeing birds coming in for necropsy that have lesions or injuries that I know were painful and I know impacted the mobility of the bird and, and they have become chronic. And it's like, you know what, there's no, there's no reason to keep a bird around that is, is number one suffering. And, and so I think just primarily for welfare, for welfare issues, you need to eliminate the bird for its own sake. Um, but I think it's also an economic decision. Culling is an important management tool in broiler production. So you have to become familiar with how to euthanize a bird. So euthanasia is, you know, we know what it is. It's the ending of a life. Uh, it, 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 there are a number of guidelines out there. Veterinarians use the American Veterinary Medical Association. They have published uh, guidelines for euthanasia in all sorts of species but also you can see poultry industry council um, in ontario has generated uh, practical guidelines for on-farm euthanasia of poultry so that's another resource i think that would be really important so understand that there are acceptable and unacceptable methods and it's based on does it uh, does it harm the bird the characteristics of euthanasia has to be rapid irreversible and prompt death so culling sick or injured birds, um, birds that are in pain that can't be treated, or if there's obviously little chance of resolving, uh, should be promptly culled. Um, the other piece of that is also you don't want birds that are going to struggle through their life and then end up being condemned or downgraded at the processing plant. So eliminate those birds are just going to be um, a draw on economics because they're going to hopefully if they can get to the feed and water they can they can eat eat your food but they're not going to end up providing you with a, a wholesome product at the end so all i can say is about uh be familiar with the be familiar with the the technique of euthanizing a bird it handling the birds all i say is be respectful these are you know these animals are suffering that that um you know there's no reason to handle them in, in a way other than uh, with kindness. And so, of course, if you're going to start eliminating birds through culling or even through mortality, have a mortality disposal plan. So figure out what you're going to be doing. Uh, composting of carcasses is an extremely good method uh, for, for getting rid of uh, dead poultry, but you can also bury and burn them. But the last thing that you need to do is send them out for, for uh, the coyotes or for the eagles to eat. So I know that that's uh, some people actually provide that's their disposal plan. They'll throw them over the fence and let the predators uh, scavengers take, take, don't do that. So I need to address unacceptable methods. So, I mean, pretty obvious, right? Suffocation, drowning, um, freezing. Um, again, this is, again, these are in the standards, euthanasia without stunning and yet kind of follow that arrow and what happens uh, during home processing, you take a conscious bird, hang it upside down and cut its throat. So again, it's, it's kind of like a double standard. I mean, I'm not, I understand, you know, to me, I've done, I've done home processing tons of times. I've done that, but uh, I always, uh, I don't cut throats. I actually use a garden uh, snipper and I do a decapitation when they're hanging. So that's different because I, a decapitation is an acceptable method. So a uh, hot gas through a tailpipe, uh, blunt trauma of the bird against an object, which is different from an object against a bird. So again, some people will um, throw the bird. Uh, carbon dioxide from a fire extinguisher, dry ice. None of these are acceptable methods. There are alternatives and please don't be tempted to uh, kill the birds using these methods. Learn to do cervical dislocation. I think this is a really important um, tactic to have. It causes the neck to separate just below the head. And you can see between the two hash lines is a full cervical dislocation. There'll be a lot of blood, but be, because you're not decapitating and decapitation is a really good 
form of euthanasia, by the way. Uh, but you're not going to get all that hemorrhage because all the hemorrhage is going to just gather underneath the skin. Ringing or swing, ringing the neck or swinging by the head is not acceptable. If you saw the nature of the lesions that were generated by ringing, it is not a cervical dislocation. It will kill the bird, but uh, there's a lot of pain involved with that. So uh, I don't see ringing or swinging of the head as an acceptable form of euthanasia because it does impose more, um, more pain than necessary. Curtis has a question. Um, is Kelsey still here? She's still in the, the conversation, the discussion here from the BC Chicken Marketing Board. Yes, we are both still here. Kelsey, you gave gave me a description one time of of how to do um, the cervical dislocation. Is that something that you'd? I, I think we're in the right audience. We could we could share that with everybody on how to do it. Would you do that yeah, again? And, um, well, I think Vicky's the expert on that. <laughs> or maybe um, it was something that I was getting to. Maybe I'm jumping the gun. Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Like okay. uh, in, in our commercial growers um, who undergo their annual audit with the chicken board here in Abbotsford, um, that is a mandatory now under the Chicken Farmers of Canada. Um, regarding animal care program um, and what we audit too. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, but going back to what Vicki had said regarding like a shears or a scissors um, type of instrument, we do see a lot of growers use those as well with the young birds with the calling. Um, and that is also acceptable in the younger birds. That's great, thanks. You know, this is something if you want, uh, we can defer to next Thursday if we want to talk more in detail on the process. It's hard to describe. It's definitely a hands on learning experience. Um, once you get the hang of it, it, it can be uh, quite efficient. Um, but you do have to, you know, we, we've offered euthanasia seminars um, for people to come and, and experience that. Um, the truth is, you know, in our in our training seminars, we actually kill the birds with CO2 uh, and then immediately because when you're learning, the last thing you want to do is learn on an animal and not do it properly. Um, as I learned in trying to do a cervical dislocation on a goose and I realized I was beyond my physical capability, it was dreadful. I've been traumatized ever since. But Anyways, uh, so, so cervical dislocation, we did it with CO2 killed birds, so, but they were still very pliable and compliant. And then you can get the real sense. And once you get it, you get it. I mean, it's, it's not difficult, but um, it's something that can be easily learned. If, if you want, we can address it on Thursday. Sure, Vicki, I'll put it in our, our bucket list. We'll kind of have like an ongoing bucket list discussion points for Thursday. And then we can gauge interest perhaps through the week and see if people want to go into it further or maybe, you know, yeah. just like a handbook or a fact sheet is sufficient. Yeah. Thanks. All right. A little bit about nutrition. Yeah. I think I've limited it to maybe one page. Flea delivery systems. Again, you need to have uh, a delivery system that addresses um, adequate feeder space, which is four to five inches per bird. It should be inside the coop, not outside, because you don't want to be attracting wild birds. And uh, you want to minimize wastage so the birds are not actually picking their feet up out of the litter. Uh, certainly a commercial diet is highly recommended, but understand that if birds are on range um, or fed scraps, you're diluting that complete feed by, um, by these additional uh, sources of nutrition. Uh, grit, the addition of grit. Now, broilers don't necessarily need it, especially corn-based diets have a lot of the, the like they can still grind and, uh, and absorb uh, the nutrition they need, but uh, grit will increase the nutri nutritional availability. But it's important to feed a formulated feed for the specific type and level of production. So, um, you know, there's starters, pre-starters, starters, you know, finishers, growing, growing out, that kind of thing. So it's important to feed the birds for uh, the type and level of production. The last thing we want to do is feed uh, layer feed to to broiler chickens because they has far too much calcium and it will really take out their kidneys. So that kind of thing. Uh, the feed source, always consider um, a good quality feed from a HACCP mill. And again, I'm going to the uh, HACCP feed mills because 
uh, they have the proper formulation and they are accountable and certainly traceable. The feed storage for bagged feed is usually about three months, but it's important to avoid getting uh, that kind of feed wet and uh, keep it rodent proof. Just uh, uh, an understanding that med if you get a medicated broiler feed, it contains an anticoccidial, not an antibiotic. So some people presume the medicated feed has antibiotics in it, but it doesn't. Uh, what's really interesting is in Canada, we do not recognize anticoccidials as an antibiotic, yet in the States, they've included um, anticoccidials as antibiotics for, for the, when they're restricting um, um, their, what's included in their feed. <coughs> Excuse me. So understand that, that birds that are vaccinated for coccidiosis should not be fed a, medica fed a medicated feed because that medicated feed contains an anticoccidial and you're going to be killing your vaccine. So I know coccidiosis is super important. Um, it's, it's ubiquitous, but the thing to understand with coccidiosis is that uh, the organism is called Imeria and it's a single cell protozoan parasite. There are nine strains that are pathogenic in chickens and five in turkeys. Um, excuse me, I'm gonna cough. <coughs> Talking too much, I guess. They're host specific so that the strains that are in turkeys do not affect uh, strains in chickens. <coughs> and like uh, sheep and pigs, all and calves, all have their own type of uh, coccidiosis, but it's not, it's not um, um, infective to chickens. Because coccidiosis is so important, I knew I have to address some of this. So we talked about the host specificity. So. The nice thing is it's all treated by Amprol. So depending on what species gets coccidiosis, you have the same uh, product. But again, uh, the, you know, the vaccines are so good is that they don't have all nine strains of Imeria in the vaccine, but they have a, a, a cluster of different, usually five strains of the pathogenic ones for, for chickens. So the, the life cycle is really simple. It's a direct life cycle. So you have these uh, parasites, these protozoan parasites passed out in the droppings. They're not infective at that point. Now, this, there's, a, there's a management component in here because when the oocysts, these parasite eggs come out, they're very resistant in the environment because they're encapsulated, but they're not infective. They need uh, some environmental time and uh, to become infective. So usually at the very, in the ideal conditions, and that is with moisture and temperature, they will take about two days to become infective. So then when they're ingested, they will continue the, um, so they become infective, they're ingested, and then the cycle repeats. So the point I want to make is that those, those ideal conditions for the parasites to become infective is related to the moisture in the litter and the temperature. So in particular, we can control some of that. And in particular, it comes down to litter management. Litter moisture, uh, again, we have outbreaks of coccidiosis related to uh, when there's spilled waterers or water, leaky waterers. And so you get um, a lot of the, the coccidia becoming infective all at once. And so it becomes a litter management issue as the is primary, um, um, factor in coccidiosis. So when it comes to litter management, number one is going to be ventilation, keeping it dry through the movement of air. So ventilation, believe it or not, has an impact on coccidiosis. I, I love to throw these pictures up. I know they're kind of horrific, uh, especially before lunch, but you know, I talked about the nine species of coccidia and each of these species of coccidia have a different area of the intestinal tract that they infect. So you can see this is the gizzard here, the duodenum. Now there's not a lot of bacteria in this uh, higher up in the intestinal tract because of course there's a lot of acid coming in from the, the proventriculus. So what ends up happening is as we go down through the intestinal tract, more and more bacteria build up. And then at the lower intestinal tract, there's a lot of bacteria. So these different species of coxi, what's fascinating to me is depending on the level of where they cause their lesion, the clinical signs are different. 
So I know that probably you hear when there is um, when there is uh, bloody feces, bloody stool, that's a coxy sign. So that's usually uh, and it causes mortality. So that's the, the type of coxy that is down here that causes the cecum to be full of blood and that will cause mortality. But most of coxy are higher up and they don't actually cause mortality, but what they will do is cause poor feed efficiency, cause enteritis, uh, birds will back off feed, not feel well, they have a, a belly ache. And so what will happen is you'll get start to get uneven birds because some of the birds are just suffering through not being able to absorb their nutrients properly. They're not feeling well, so they're not eating. And that, and again, coccidiosis probably has a greater impact on production through subclinical or, or not mortality as you would see in sequel coccidiosis. So I hope that kind of helps explain that uh, coccidiosis doesn't always start and end with uh, bloody feces and infection in the lower intestinal tract, which is one single species of imeria. Um, Vicky, uh, yeah, sorry. sorry there, there was um, a set of symptoms that uh, was a question mark, diarrhea late in the grow out period and undigested feed in the feces. Oh, I'm, well, so undigested feed in the feces would imply to me that there's, um, that, the, that, that there's diarrhea and that the feed isn't being, and this is in a broiler chicken, I presume? I, I presume, yeah, broilers, yeah. yeah. But yeah, diarrhea yeah. late in the grow out and yeah. undigested uh, feed. Yeah, I mean, that tell, the undigested feed tells me that that things are moving through too fast. So there's not enough time for things to be digested and absorbed. So that's an enteritis. So the enteritis, you know, I was definitely be looking at coxy with that. And uh, if it, in an old, like uh, the undigested feed in the um, in, a, in an older bird, you'd look at things like tuberculosis, but that's not happening in broiler chickens. But, you know, again, dietary, are they, they having access to the outside? Could this be, um, you know, something they've ingested as far as that's irritating? But coxie, I would look at that for sure. Because, um, and then the other thing is, you can see at the bottom here is that we could actually get mortality uh, when the coxie is combined with an intestinal bacteria. So any kind of enteritis, uh, either you look at nutritional sources or you definitely figure out what's going on in that intestinal tract so that the transit time has been reduced and things are coming out before they have a chance to be absorbed. The other thing too, under just a feed, I mean, I would um, just double check that there's enough grit and that they have they have the ability to uh, grind down what's being ingested. Then you also want to look like maybe the feed. I mean, if you're feeling whole grains, again, you're going to be requiring that grit be able to to put it down like to to grind it into smaller pieces so it can be absorbed yeah thanks vicky <clears throat> so with coccidiosis it is a disease of younger birds because they do gain immunity with with low level exposure which is exactly what the vaccine is intended to do um to it's difficult you know it's difficult to I actually thought hers was put to be on it what's that Sorry, we just had an unmuted participant. It's all good. Okay. All right. Uh, so um, difficult to eradicate because it's kind of ubiquitous in the bird's environment. So again, I talked about keeping the litter dry, uh, rotating um, the pasture if possible, and that's just really to dilute things. And birds out on range certainly don't usually have problems with coccidiosis because of this dilutional effect. And it's important if you're raising broilers that you have an all in all out management, meaning you have one batch and, you're, and you once they're processed, you have the ability to uh, clean out their environment, um, cleaning and disinfection and wait for the and then uh, waiting for the next placement. Uh, the vaccination again at the hatchery, but you can also actually vaccinate in the first week, you can get your hands on the vaccine, you can apply it on like and spray it on top of the food in the first week and that's a way of vaccinating for them and this allows a controlled infection and allows that natural immunity to build up in in the intestinal tract um, medicated feed is a preventative if you're not going to vaccinate and uh, treatment is with ampro uh, should you have a problem so which is highly uh, available um, 
This is another disease that I found quite fascinating. It's one of those diseases of production. We don't usually see this in uh, birds that are not pushed for production, but this is ascites or water belly. It truly is a congestive heart failure, which is also called round heart in turkeys. Uh, it's the same, same pathology in, in the background um, where you have this picture here. You can see this is a normal heart. And what you find is that the heart has become flaccid and thin walled and really has no longer an effective forward pump. So the birds are going into heart failure. Things are backing up. And uh, what you'll find is that uh, the lungs will fill with fluids. The birds actually look, first of all, they look dark. They look bluish because they're not oxygenating their blood, but also they have respiratory signs. It looks like they're having trouble breathing, but the fact is their, their lungs and their air sacs is, are filling with fluid. This flaccid dilated heart is characteristic, but because things are backing up, then fluid starts to leak out of the circulatory system and it starts to accumulate in the abdomen. And that's what the term ascites is. Ascites is fluid in the abdomen. So uh, you can see the bird on the on the right is super dark, and then you can see the abdomen is distended with fluid. If you if you just kind of push on it, you'll just it's a, it's like a water balloon that's that's uh, kind of like full of fluid. Uh, this picture here was taken where uh, there's a little nick in the abdominal wall, and then you can see this spout of fluid just coming out. So. What's behind that? Number one, it's, it's a modern broiler problem. Uh, it's predisposed by chilling. We often see a lot of water belly in, in the, the spring and in the fall where the, the days are warm, but the nights are cold. And the best way to prevent this is going to be ensuring that there's supplemental heat for cool evenings. We also see this in younger birds if they've been exposed to high carbon dioxide levels. So uh, again, sometimes we see this when uh, a brooder that um, is malfunctioning and generating far too much CO2 or not being able to, uh, sometimes we see this in the trucks when there's not a lot of good ventilation in, ch in shipping the chicks. So high uh, CO2 exposure will predispose to ascites. And I'll bet uh, Curtis has seen this for sure. Is that right, Curtis? Yeah, we've <laughs> seen a fair bit of it. We have in 90, Eight ninety nine percent of the time, we will condemn the bird. We will because when we open it up to eviscerate it, all that fluid will come out. But then there's also a smell that is comes comes along with all that fluid, and the carcass just has an awful smell. So if we stick that bird in a bag at the end of the day, and you send it off to whoever, or if you keep it for yourself, you open that bag up when you get it home. That's the first thing that hits you, and that's not not uh, not something that we want to put out to the public. It's not that leaves our facility. So, right, yeah. So, uh, I think, sorry, go ahead. How long does it usually take for something like that to happen? Like we travel from Cranbrook and actually take our birds to you, Curtis, for butcher. So I'm just kind of wondering, like, what's how long does it take for that? No, seal? no, I. I think there's a, a confusion on the, the transport. I want to I want to say from my standpoint, it's not something that happens from from farm to here to my place. It's at the Vicky probably elaborate more on it at the younger age. Is that correct, Vicky? Yeah, that's what I'm sorry if I wasn't clear, but that's exactly right. It, it's when the chicks mm. are being transported and they're exposed to high mm. CO2. No, it's not. This does not happen overnight. This is this is chronicity over days to weeks. OK, uh, yeah. So the other thing, too, when it comes to condemning this, this is absolutely a condemnable uh, situation because you have a circulation that's flawed and not being able to. I mean, anything to do with liver, li uh, liver lesions should condemn the part the, condemn the carcass because, you know, that liver is really important for detoxifying and doing all sorts of other metabolic things. So if your liver is compromised, I would question the the um you know how wholesome the 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 carcass would be. Okay, so we like we have our birds shipped in from Alberta, and they usually take like it's probably an overnight trip for them. Mm -hmm. But we haven't had any issues with this that I'm aware of. So I, I'm assuming right. we're kind of 
it's a safe bet that we're okay. Like you're talking yeah. days and yeah, you start okay. to see this, if there's going to be a problem, uh, you know, you can certainly the, you can see it in, in chicks really young related to the high CO2 in shipping or chilling, but the problem is the chilling during the growing period. It's the evening chills. And so we can start to see the three, four, five, six weeks of age. Okay. Yeah. So the birds are like that heart is trying. I mean, there's a point of no return for sure, but the heart is trying to pump. And so you, you, you know, the bird remains alive, but just, uh, they can be, they can be confused with respiratory though. That's, that's a, a, a message in this too, is they look, first of all, they look like they're having trouble breathing. It's just cause they're so full of fluid. Yeah. To, to add to that as well. Like you'll, we get birds that come in like that picture on the right that are smaller like mm -hmm. and then we get we also get birds that look perfectly healthy that are full grown like they're they got an ample amount of breast meat their thighs and everything's good but then when we open them up they're full of fluid in there yeah um so it's not just a poor growing bird it that it affects but they this again it's just visually what we've seen come in um, yeah. You can have a bird that looks perfectly fine as well, that will be, have, maybe it isn't coccidiosis, but, but it, it, it presents the same on the inside it does. Um, and this, the, the, or not coccidiosis, sorry, ascites, it presents the same as ascites. And in this ascites, it's probably in the top, top three, top four of uh for what we condemn it is and probably one of the most controversial controversial ones as well because there we get it we condemn it and then we get some producers that are like well it's just fluid on the inside it doesn't affect the meat at all like the meat looks perfectly fine we're like no if if you could be on the floor with us when we eviscerate it when we first cut into it and you see what comes out of it, it would make you not want to eat chicken again. It wouldn't. <laughs> so we we yeah. just try to explain the best we can to everybody why we gotta why we gotta condemn it. So yeah. So this is yeah. this is definitely a disease of production because what's mm -hmm. happened is the genetic selection for these birds is one for really rapid growth rate. And at the same time, they probably never genetically selected for a cardiovascular system that can actually support the growth rate that these birds are being pushed towards. So it's hap what ha usually happens is the birds are kind of walking a fine line of, of anyways. And so then anything that you, anything that is going to put uh, metabolic demand on that heart and again, chilling because suddenly the bird needs to up its, you know, its heart rate will go up and it's going to try to keep itself warm. So what will end up happening is, is the heart will just fail because suddenly the metabolic, this new metabolic demand is placed on it. And it just isn't capable of, of getting, uh, of doing that again, um, a modern broiler problem. So very, very common. So uh, to me, the better defense is to really pay attention to the temperatures. And if there's going to be, if the evenings are, are cooler then you know, put out some supplemental heat so the birds can actually, um, main, you know, not have to rely on their meta metabolism to generate the heat to keep warm. Vicki, I was just hoping I could clarify if there's a time of the grow out when it's most critical or becomes less critical to worry about cold nights. Uh, personally, I've also seen this in layer uh, flocks, like in rooster culls and stuff, uh, or old hens. Um, so, or not that old hens, but uh, so I'm wondering if there, if, if this is a constant problem, like if cold nights continue to be a problem, throughout the grow out yeah no it's it's usually usually these birds are like four to six weeks but with the with that are tipped over by the um by the cooler temperatures but um the other piece of the, you know the other piece of this is uh we don't tend to see it earlier um Mm, I'm not sure. Say, uh, I guess I'm wondering if there's a, a period of time when it's most critical to make sure. So there's a lot of outdoor growers, say, who are doing a yeah. three week uh, brooding period and then putting right. their, their chickens outside. Yeah. Um, and maybe that's where they're getting cold if people are trying to push the ends of the season and it's not really yeah. the warm summer. 
Yeah. And so in those instances, uh, stocking density becomes important because as birds get older, they're generating a lot of heat themselves. So you can take advantage of that. So, so you want to have the right stocking density that allows the, the birds to generate their own heat to help everything out um, that way. So yeah, the other thing too is I mentioned earlier about hot brooding. So sometimes if the temperature isn't stepped down, the birds have no, uh, no um, uh, stim uh, stimulus to feather out. So you want to be a little bit, you want the right temperatures, but early on you want them to feather out. Again, it's a way of they can maintain their own body temperature at a better rate. So, so a little like hardening off your plants in the greenhouse yeah. before sending them outside. Yeah, but yeah, but you have to be again, it's a fine line, you have to, to balance it. But you know, but it's definitely worth stepping down. And again, you don't have to actually step down, but you, you should provide uh, the birds, um, the ability to find their own comfort level for thermal heat. Thanks. Yeah. So late, oh, we're going to get close on the time here. So I, I did want to talk about um, lameness and leg problems, which is another big deal. Uh, you can see uh, some of these are, you know, environmentally, it can be related to overcrowding and and uh, and poor wet litter conditions. So, I think foot pad erosions, and we see these incredibly commonly in range birds. Um, and again, uh, we don't see this in commercial barns. I can I can tell you that these are turkey paws that you can see on the on the bottom left, uh, sorry, the bottom right. And then there actually is a foot pad erosion, um, a lesion scoring uh, process for, uh, you know, again, it comes down to litter. And I think this is a preventable injury and it has strong welfare implications, but uh, it's important that we pay attention to those feet. So I just, uh, again, I just wanted to, again, talk about culling. This was, we did a turkey uh, mortality in, in some of the permitted growers. We did a turkey mortality where we looked at all of the birds that died um, in 12 different uh, uh, permitted turkey grower flocks. And see, these are some of the things that came through. I look at that leg and this is again, uh, if you look at the legs down here, you can see this is a slip tendon right here. Um, this is a slip tendon with, the, I could not straighten this leg out. You can see this bowing of this. These are, these are birds that are gonna be visibly lame. These birds should have been culled. There's no point in getting a bird like this uh, all the way to processing to, to try to get a downgrade. It's not gonna be worth it. And for humane purposes, we need to cull those birds out. This, uh, this one in particular really bothered me because this is the top of the leg, uh, top of the foot. And you can see this erosion, this bird's been kind of walking on this stump. Again, someone's gonna be able to see that. That is not a bird that should have been allowed to continue. And again, I, I really think culling is, is something you need to adopt in your in program. This is a broiler chicken. Again, I can say that's an American picture because look at the litter. So anyways, this is a bird that's down, uh, even though it's next to the feeder, feeder uh, that bird has a spinal cord injury and it's not gonna do well. So these birds should have been culled. So we can see curly toe paralysis with uh, vitamin B deficiency. Again, we don't see this on complete rations. Uh, we occasionally see rickets, which is a vitamin D and or a calcium phosphorus imbalance problem. Uh, incredibly painful. Uh, I just want to point out that the pictures you're seeing, uh, um, the bending of the bones and the bending of the beak, they're very rubbery. Those are birds are already dead. So um, I would never do that in a live bird. But the nice thing about nutritional leg problems is they do respond very quickly to supplementation with vitamin D. So that's uh, it's almost used as a diagnostic tool. We have some uh, physiologic we have twisted legs, uh, slip tendons, that kind of thing. Uh, it goes all the way back. Once you see lesions uh, develop and, and lameness develop in the birds, whatever initiated it is probably weeks prior to that. And sometimes it can be as simple as slippery chick papers or the substrate that the, the chicks are placed on. If it doesn't give them a lot of uh, stability, they will their bones will start to grow in an abnormal um, fashion. Uh, and we also have infectious causes for la lameness, and that can be bone abscesses. Uh, it can be real virus, which affects the tendon behind the hawk. 
and uh, and so uh, those birds would be visibly lame. And again, lameness is something that um, if it doesn't look like it's going to resolve, uh, needs to be eliminated through culling. Um, modern broilers are designed to be predictable and uniform. Uh, that's the nature of the efficiency of commercial production. So uh, when flocks become come uneven or if they're underweight, there's usually environmental conditions you need to investigate, overcrowding, wet litter, coccidiosis or nutritional issues. Um, sudden death here again, I, I, you know, one of the things maybe we can talk about next Thursday is, is uh, mortality patterns because I think they're very insightful. So I was just going to address something. I'm trying going to try to hurry through now because I think we are very close to the cutoff time. I was going to talk about sudden death. There can be a, many, many different causes, environmental as well as infectious. But one of the pieces I need to address is predation. So predation can be come from a, a variety of predators, and sometimes you can figure it out just by what they've left behind. Um, and so again, as somebody who is first to admit that I have lost birds to multiple predators, there's no excuse to lose birds to predators. I think that's our responsibility to figure it out and uh, to do an appropriate job of protecting them. And that can be by investing in electrified fences or making sure the fences that are, um, you know, that a predator can't dig under or go over or go through. And so um, bacterial uh, infections for sure. So don't need to spend much time on that. For shipping, again, feed withdrawal. You don't withdraw the water, um, but you should withdraw the feed so that the birds have had no access to feed eight to 12 hours before processing. So you need to be able to figure when processing is gonna occur for when you're gonna um, um, uh, take the feed up. And uh, this prevents carcass contamination, contamination at processing. Uh, gentle catch and supporting the chest in an upright position and putting them into the appropriate size crate, the right number of birds, uh, providing good ventilation through the transport and uh, avoiding chilling or overheating. And again, coordinate with the processor to minimize the holding time. So it's, it's coordinated effort. Um, again, I don't think I need to talk too much about this. These are farm origin downgrades, untreated injury. Um, again, greening, discoloration, those kind of things, those are happening on the farm. So these are turkeys. Uh, bruising uh, and fractures that are happening pre-catching. The one with the yellow arrow is actually a fracture that is trying to heal itself. So again, I'm sure this bird would have had a dropped wing that was uh, someone could be able to, uh, to see. The greening and discoloration is a time um, which is opposed to, this is a catching injury. So it's a leg and when you cut into it, you have very fresh hemorrhage. And that, that, that to me is a different uh, issue than having these other uh, discolored bruises and things like that, which are injuries that are occurring even before catch. Um, this should be available. I think everybody can take a look at this. I was going to go through what the condoms can tell you, what the causes are, and um, some of the things that can be done in the flock to prevent that from happening. You can see over in prevention, you'll see cull come up quite a bit. <laughs> Again, maybe these are birds that don't need to hit the processing plant so you don't get a condemn report on it. Um, and again, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm flipping through these because I know we're very close to, to the end time. Talking once again about the, uh, the same resources. And again, Rachel's putting a, a list together. So that's really good. But I did want to just, I'm going to end here and talk about the Animal Health Center in Abbotsford, which is the provincial veterinary diagnostic lab by the ministry uh, in the ministry um we we're one of the very few we're one of three fully accredited veterinary diagnostic labs in canada and we do all species we have um the ability to now what's really nice is that for small flocks and again this special secret number is 100 birds or less or 99 birds for 25 dollars, you can submit your birds and we will do a full diagnostic workup and that's uh, uh, myself and Dr. Tony Redford are the avian diagnostic pathologists at the lab. So um, I think I'm going to stop there. And, uh, and I know we're at time, so I'm sorry for, for going over. But um, anyways, hand it over to Rachel.
Great. Thank you, Vicky. Thanks for speeding along there. And we knew that it was a hefty agenda to get through. You did a great job at speeding through. We had uh, one question here. Andrew replied to Christy, but I'll read it out anyways. It's from Christy and she said, average grow time for a seven, five to seven pound chicken. Where do you find vitamins? How often is bedding change, changed or layered? Uh, chicken tractor site, question mark. So I guess, where do you find vitamins and how often is bedding changed or layered? I'm not too concerned if these aren't answered today, just kind of thoughts that I had when I was going along that I didn't want to lose my train of thought. Totally. That's great. <laughs> I mean, the multivitamins, they're, they're a product you can get where you get your feed. Usually uh, they're carried by the feed stores. Okay. I can take a look. I, I haven't seen anything like that before. They usually just offer electrolytes. So I know. <laughs> so I, I was, know. You can ask said, them to bring like, in. That's always the first thing that they suggest is electrolytes. I've never actually heard anybody mention vitamins for chickens before. So, oh my goodness. Yeah. There are lots of really good formulations. And again, the nice thing is they, they're, they can come in a little foil pouch. So like I said, a level teaspoon per gallon. And, and again, uh, when it comes to vitamins, you need to change it every day. So, yep. yeah. Okay. The, the grow time one, the average grow time for five to seven pounds. It's, that's a question that we get off, asked lots, that is, and sort of come to the conclusion, it all depends on what, how the grower manages their flock, it does. Like we've put out time frames before in the past, like with what we're capable of hitting, but yeah. then, but then the producer brings us the birds and like, well, you told me they'd be this size at, at this amount of weeks. So we just we just stop. It, it all depends on what, what the grower or what yourself is doing and how you're managing everything to hit, hit that targeted weight. Like some so, people, some people can hit five, six pounds in, in set seven or eight weeks. And then others, it'll take nine, 10, sometimes 11 weeks. So it all so, depends what, what your program is and how it, it probably how, goes uh, to like the size of the area that they're in as well, because 2020 we sent a batch to you guys and we got about five to seven pounds they were in a bit smaller of an area and then 2021 they basically like free ranged almost a full five acres which was not initially the plan but they kept escaping and they were way smaller and we did nine weeks so the first year we were 12 weeks last year we were nine weeks and they were quite a bit smaller and had more free range of our property. So I'm, I'm thinking that they need something smaller, which was my next question was the chicken tractors. Like what, yeah. what do people do for yeah. chicken tractors in the spring and summer to, or like the spring, I guess, to keep their birds warm in order to have, in order to have them to a good size to go to the butcher for June. Yeah. These might, both these questions might want to might want to save these till till okay. next Thursday and then we can we can go in in depth a little bit more on them maybe yeah. <laughs> and write them down yeah I'm writing them down as well Curtis mm -hmm. um so yeah it's just like having a conversation on Thursday about like what's a good timing and method in in the Kootenai specific if we're doing pasture yeah. poultry because last year we had a lot more rain than we usually get, which I mean, it's, you can't prevent that, but then again, it leads to your birds are coming in wet because they're outside. And like that, likely this is probably why we lost so many birds last year. Like we just, we just had problem after problem. So. Yeah. Giving them that, that bigger area too. And it, on how how far they got to travel to feed feed or water and then and then uh how many how many feeders and how much feeding space in general that yeah. there is for the amount of birds that you have you have lots of birds but not enough feeders well there's not enough room for all them birds to get at the feeders that are out well that's going to affect your affect your your feed ratio feed feed to uh, weight gain ratio it yeah. is so yeah there's all sorts of all sorts of different factors again this is just stuff from 
my experience as well that I've learned and it they're, they're, <laughs> chickens are hard they are <laughs> I mean this this is great because honestly like it it gives us some ideas for this year because we're hoping again for a bit of a shorter grow time to do like eight to nine weeks we don't want to go kind of past that mm. so it's what do we have to do to get there to yeah. get the five to seven pound mark mm -hmm. thursday yes Maybe we'll, yeah that yeah. sound all right yeah uh, absolutely hmm. vicky do you have any comments about that like not going too deeply just about the the space and range for the the chickens yeah, and I think an easy tool would be weekly weighing. Like you can actually look at some of these production manuals that give you the expected weights for time, or like how old they are. And then just make sure that your, your broods are on track through just weighing, depending on how many you have, just see where they are and, um, and maybe addressing just if there's any deficiencies. And like obviously birds that are like have full range to five acres, they're going to be spending a lot of energy, not in growing, but in actually moving around. So yeah. sometimes containment is, is really the best way to do it. And there are, there are ways that in a, in a chicken tractor, you can help. So certainly there should be some kind of canopy that is, uh, and, and then uh, uh, even just putting out like a, a bunch of, uh, like a, some straw or some, something that will actually uh, allow the, the bottom of them to have some insulation during the yeah. evening, those kind of things. Yeah, they, they're messy. I've never seen chickens. <laughs> <laughs> another good okay. question from stephanie that could probably be covered on thursday but uh, just the question about continuously feeding versus restricting yeah. feed pulling feed so something else to discuss yes i'll address that i like that that's a good topic well great everybody it um it sounds like we've done a good brainstorm and just you know just started the conversation here um, we will definitely get you this video and all the resources out before next Thursday. Um, so that if you want to rewatch or folks who couldn't attend today, at least they'll have some prep and ready for Thursday and we'll send out reminders and everything for the Thursday one. Please make sure that you register because it is a separate link than today's event. And in the meantime, I'd really like to thank Vicki and Curtis for your time today, um, to, present us with such a fantastic presentation and sort of get us started thinking about poultry health and all the different parameters involved. I really appreciate it. And to all the attendees for your great questions, thank you for coming out. And by all means, feel free to fire me an email or Andrew or Curtis before next Thursday, if you have additional things you want to add to our bucket list. And more than anything, Vicki, it's just really great to also just make the connection with yourself to all our small scale growers here in the Kootenays, because I feel like this is the start of developing a relation potentially over the next few years. It's, it's so great that you're passionate about small flocks and uh, we can access your expertise and get to know you and, and help Thank us you. work through our production issues in the Kootenays. Yeah. So without further ado, I guess we'll just uh, leave it there. I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon and um, enjoy this mild, balmy weather that's uh, overtaking us all. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, for your time and answering my questions. Great. Thanks for thanks, joining. Vicky, thanks, Curtis. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, guys. Okay.